My goal today is that I wanted to get us started thinking about history as a topic. And I thought I'd do this by talking about something that is just very recent that's actually also historical. We're going to talk a little bit more then about the discipline of the history of psychology and talk a little bit more about why we even have a history of psychology. Well, I want to talk first of all about this article that came out in 2019 by Young and Hegarty in the journal Feminism and Psychology. You can see the title, it's Reasonable Men, Sexual Harassment, and Norms of Conduct in Social Psychology. So I do want to give you a trigger warning. There is talk here about sexual harassment and men doing basically bad things to women in psychology. But let's go ahead and talk about two historical examples about sexual harassment in psychology by noted researchers in the field. Now, Young and Haggerty start off their article talking about this classic article. And some of you may have already come across it before in other courses. It's an experiment on cognitive dissonance that was published in 1959 by Elliot Aronson and Judson Mills. And you can see the title is The Effect of Severity of Initiation on Liking for a Group. Maybe you remember hearing about this when you first learned about cognitive dissonance. It's the study where they made women go through an embarrassing procedure and then they later listened to a discussion of a group that they were about to join and it turned out that the group was fairly boring. But it's actually considered a classic social psychology experiment. Aronson and Mills were both PhD students of Leon Festinger, the guy who came up with the theory of cognitive dissonance. The three of them were at Stanford University. Mills and Aronson were just finishing up their PhDs at the time that they published this paper. So think of this as like basically a couple of grad students who did this study as part of their experiences working with Leon Festinger. It's considered a citations classic, this paper. It's taught in almost every introductory psychology course and it appears in nearly every social psychology textbook. So let's just look at this experiment in a little bit more detail. You can see that the subjects, which they call S here for subjects, were 63 college women, 63 women at Stanford University. 33 of them volunteered to participate in a series of group discussions on the psychology of sex. The remaining 30, tested at a somewhat later date, were what they called captive volunteers from a psychology course who elected to participate in the group discussions on the psychology of sex in preference to several other experiments. So these were different groups and they were done at different times, but they say here, since the results obtained from these two samples were very similar, they combined them in the analysis that's presented here. I think it's interesting that they called them captive volunteers. And I guess that's what we do with our first year courses. And But you know, there they're doing it for credit. I don't really understand this concept of why they call them captive volunteers. But first of all, it's just really important to understand it's women and the women think they're going to be talking about sex in the study. Now there are three experimental conditions. They had a severe group, a mild group, and a control group. And if you look at the sample sizes, 21 in each of the conditions, it's a small size considering what we know about statistical power today. They had 21 people in each of these three conditions. And you can see that in the severe condition, what they did is that the women were told that they were going to join a discussion group next week that's going to talk about sex. and they wanted to see how the women were, how they would respond to this before they joined the group. So they wanted to make sure they could handle different kinds of topics that might come up when they're in the actual sex discussion group. So the people in the severe group had a fairly embarrassing condition to go through here. They had this test in which they had 12 obscene words and they had to read two vivid descriptions of sexual activity from a novel. And the novel was Lady Chatterley's Lover. So they had these very two very vivid sex descriptions that they had to read aloud to the two male experimenters. And that was what was called the severe condition. The mild condition didn't have any of the stuff from the novel. It just had reading five words. And these words were all sexual, but they're not obscene. And then there's the control group. Okay. And so after you and the control group is just asked if they could discuss sex freely. And then after they were done going through whatever their condition happened to be in, they were then told that they were now going to be able to listen in live to the group that they'd be joining next week because right now the group is meeting and they're having a discussion and so you can listen in and see what it's like. And what they did is they actually had a recording of some women having 
a very dull, boring conversation about sex. No one seemed to know anything or really be interested in about sex. It was just really a very dull conversation. And so after they gave the participants a few minutes to listen to this boring conversation of this group that they were supposedly going to be joining next week, they asked the women how much they think they'd like the people in that group and how much they were looking forward to being in the group. So that was the dependent variable in, from this cognitive dissonance perspective. The idea is that if you've gone through the severe condition and then you just got had to listen to this boring discussion, you might say to yourself, gee, I went through this really severe, embarrassing test and there, therefore it must be really worth it. So when you hear this group discussing things that are actually fairly dull, you would have dissonance about it. So you tell yourself, wow, that really sounds exciting what these women are talking about. And they would find it more attractive or more interesting than people who are in the mild or the control group. So the point of this is that if you've gone through a severe initiation, you need to have good justification or a good way to resolve dissonance if you find out later that the group that you're going to join now that you've gone through that severe condition is actually quite boring. So anyway, I'll show you the results in the moment and what they actually found in the study. But here's an interesting question. You could say, how did they even come up with this method? How did they decide that this is the way they wanted to study cognitive dissonance? Like, how did these two guys come up with this particular method? What's interesting is that in 1988, Mills was recalling how they came up with this. And he said, we picked reading a list of dirty words, not because we had a lot of ideas and it was the cutest one. It was just the only one that seemed like it would do a good job in the context that we were working in, that the procedure was cleverly designed, not just that the manipulation was cute, but that everything worked in the sense of fitting together like a woman dressing. Okay. So think about that for a little bit. These guys are graduate students working on their PhD at Stanford University. There are men and women at the university, and they want to do a psychology experiment to test predictions derived from cognitive dissonance theory. And this is what they thought of. This is the way they thought to test the theory was to grab some women, bring them in and have them go through like a woman in a severe condition, go through a thing where they have to read dirty words and some lurid passage from a novel. So, but that, get you to think about that is the context in which they're doing this research. Like, why is it that they do what they're doing? They think it's clever. That is Mills and Aronson actually think this is a clever way to study dissonance. And there doesn't seem to be much quibbles or qualms about the fact that these women have to go through this procedure in order to test this particular theory. In fact, one of the things that they say is that I think it was actually Aronson said that they thought this was such a good way of studying dissonance because it was very much like in the real world when you join real groups and they make you go through severe initiations like this. So they thought that they were just kind of doing a mild version of this in the laboratory. Did they find what they wanted to find? And yes, they did. So the results actually supported their hypotheses from cognitive dissonance theory. And you can see here that this is a liking for the people in that group. And you remember, all three conditions are listening to a boring discussion, a group that they think are going to be joining next week. And it's the severe group who finds them most interesting or likes them the most. So they rate either the discussion or the participants in that group. And you can see that the severe group has the highest ratings of liking, whereas the control and the mild are lower than that. So that seems to fit cognitive dissonance theory or fits with the prediction that you need to resolve your dissonance so you make the group more attractive than they actually are so that you could then feel that you were justified in going through this severe initiation procedure. What happened after that paper was published in 1959 is that it became taught as the epitome of a well-crafted experiment in social psychology. And it appeared that way in many major reference texts. In fact, one of those major texts about how to design experiments was written by Aronson, who used this example himself of his own study as a really well-crafted experimental design. There were later criticisms of the study in the 1960s and 70s that thought that the gender dynamics of the study were not unethical, but perhaps they were what they were more concerned about not that there was just only women being studied here, was that perhaps there was actually a confound that the women in the severe condition maybe were sexually aroused by what they were doing. And so we don't know if the reason why they liked that group is because they were more sexually aroused. So that was the only real criticism of the study. Gerard and Mathewson in 1966 ran a replication in which they first had a screening test using electrical shock to weed out those girls who would tend to let their emotions run away with them. 
And so they ran the study again and they were able to find even a stronger effect here for the dissonance. So you can see that these two men in 1966 are going to go ahead and try to get to use the severe initiation to actually be electrical shock to see if to again test this initiation process on how they might join a group later on. So several studies like this, and like I said, it becomes quite a popular study for many reasons. Now, around the same time that this study was being done, Young and Hegarty point out that this study was being conducted and published in 1963 by Dana Brammel. And what happened in this study was that she presented male students photographs of handsome men that were in various states of undress, and they gave, she gave them false feedback via a bogus physiological piece of equipment that seemed to show that they had latent homosexual arousal. That is, they, they would make it look like they were having like a physiological reaction of skin conductance whenever they saw a male who was, you know, this attractive male being partially undressed. And so the idea was that this would give them cognitive dissonance because the assumption was that these men were all heterosexual and he's giving, getting feedback that they actually were homosexually aroused to these men would create cognitive dissonance. And so the way that Brammel thought that they might reduce their dissonance here is that they would try to go ahead and interpret other men's responses as also being homosexually aroused. That is, that their cognitive dissonance, the way that they could deal with the fact that they got this bogus feedback that they were physiologically aroused and they looked at pictures of men, could be dealt with by projecting latent homosexuality onto other men. And the way she did this is that she gave these participants cards that supposedly had been filled out by other men, these drawings, and asked them to score those cards for what she thought, what they thought those tests meant. And basically the tests were all supposed to be measures of latent homosexuality. And in fact, the men who had been given bogus feedback that they were aroused physiologically were more likely to score these cards from this test for these other men as that they were more homosexual than men who were in the condition where they didn't get that bogus feedback. So again, the point is that they're using cognitive distance theory to create their predictions, yet Brammel is using men and looking at men in terms of supposedly some sort of homosexual arousal here. So I bring that study up because Young and Hegarty Hager did. And what Young and Hegarty say is the fate of these two studies over the following decade could not have been more different. Whilst Aronson and Mill's study became a textbook classic and an example of experimental design, by the end of the 1960s, Bramwell's study was positioned as a paradigmatic case of unethical science, consideration of its possible long-term harms. In an influential criticism of de deceptive experiments, Kelman in 1967 worried about Bramwell's participants because for many persons of this age group, sexual identity is still a live and sensitive issue, and the self-doubts generated by the laboratory experience may take on a life of their own and linger for some time to come. In spite of his reference to persons of this age group, there's no question that it was only heterosexual men who occupied the position of universal subject in the experimental psychology of the 1960s. He says, Bramwell's participants incite empathy and concern that bound the limits of what experiments can be, but we are unaware of any authors in this men-dominated area of social psychology who showed any such concern for the women in the Aronson and Mill studies. Sexually harassing women is all fun and games, but sexually harassing men, and particularly inciting impressionable young men to question their heterosexuality, is a step too far. So you can see what Young and Hegarty are trying to say is, look at, there's this period of time here where these two grad students at Stanford go ahead and embarrass a group of women with a severe initiation procedure to study cognitive dissonance. And no one questions the ethics of that. No one thinks that there's anything wrong with it. But when Bramwell does the, a similar kind of study, but looks at men and gives them feedback and possibly plays around with their sexual arousal there, that's considered unethical and very serious as a, something that needs to be criticized and therefore was never brought up and as a really good experiment. Now, it could be in fact that the Bramwell study isn't a very good experiment, but the point that Young and Hegarty want to make is that these two groups are, these two studies are being treated very differently because of who the participants are. When it was women, no one seemed to have any problem what you did to women, sexually harassing them in this particular kind of context. But when it was men, the male psychologists immediately respond and say, this is unethical. 
it's what Young and Hegarty conclude about all this is they mention this quote from Aronson who says, in our experiments, the laboratory comes alive. Real things are happening to real people. And we plunked people into the middle of a situation that was so real for them that they had to respond as they would have responded outside the laboratory. So he's talking about his study, the one he did with Aronson. He's saying that, you know, we created sexual harassment in the laboratory to see what would happen. We tried to make these women get sexually embarrassed. And this is like what happens in real life. We just plump them in. And so the question is, is that good? Is it right? Would it be something that we could still do today? And why doesn't anybody really criticize that study today? Why do we still talk about it as a classic study in psychology? As they are try to argue, it's probably because men dominated the field for so long that they accepted this study is okay, but they weren't really ready to accept the other study by Bramall. Now, the other example that I want to mention here is that they talk about is not so much an experiment, but a particular psychologist, a social psychologist named Henri Toshvel, who is known for his work in social identity theory. All right, a little bit about Toshvel, just to mention something about him. He was born in Poland in 1919. And he was at university in Paris when World War II broke out. And he ended up serving in the French army and then spent a number of years in a prisoner of a war camp. The rest of his family died in the Holocaust. After the war, he became politically engaged and wanted his research that he was doing to be politically engaged as well. And he decided to focus on prejudice and discrimination. He received his PhD in 1951 at Birkbeck College at the University of London. And after that, he moved to Bristol and in the UK and started an influential research group in the 60s and 70s that studied social identity theory. Now, in Tajfel's thinking, he was trying to come up with theory here that could apply to social identity for any particular kind of identity, for any particular group. But one thing that's interesting, even though he was interested in social identity for ethnicity or religion or school, he wasn't so interested in applying it to gender. He just had no interest in that and would discourage his students from looking at gender as an identity. And he just didn't think it was really a fundamental question at that time for his students to discuss. Now, his first students were mostly male psychologists. And perhaps that's one of the reasons why they didn't really focus anything about gender at the time, about gender identity. But as the years passed, he started to have more students who were women, who were postgrads or research assistants, and they started working with him on different kinds of projects. One thing that's clear now from the historical analysis is that he had difficulty treating women as his intellectual, intellectual equals. And we know this because of some interviews with some of his former students many years later. And they said basically he had a hard time treating women at that in that field at that time as being his intellectual equal. He was quite happy working with men like Turner and having a serious collaboration with them, but he just never had any serious women collaborators and he never published any major books or theoretical papers with women during his career. He just tended to only work with men and like I said, he did end up supervising women PhDs and research assistants, but these are all facts, by the way, we've known for decades. So I'm, tell I'm not telling you anything that's really that surprising. It's just been always interesting, like why didn't he have any women collaborators? We now know that an oral history was conducted of Tajfel's students in 1999. 1999. Somebody had engaged in a project after Tajfel had passed away to understand a little bit more about Tajfel's work. And that was really the point of it, was to interview some of his former students. So they conducted this oral history where they started interviewing them and asking them about what it was like to work with Toshville and what they worked on. And what this Young and Hegarty paper found in 2019 was when they went back and listened to the oral histories, that three of the women who had been interviewed, who had been his PhD students, described Toshville's unwanted sexual attention. And they all characterized this unwanted sexual attention from Toshville as problematic, unwanted, and unsuccessful, right? So these women all gave these oral interviews and they're all just mentioning this in the context of an interview about what it was like to work with Tajfell and they happened to spontaneously bring up in their interviews how he would give them unwanted sexual attention. One of these people was Margaret Weatherall and she said in her interview, there wasn't a name for it and there wasn't a sense of how to position it, what was more worrying was the masculinist methods of the intellectual competition, which was more threatening and disturbing than sexual harassment. 
So she's saying it's it was interesting at the time. We what it really was concerning her was the fact they just favored the men in the lab group all the time in terms of intellectual competition, and she put up all the other kinds of things that he would do. Susan Condor, in 1980, a PhD many years later in 1984, she says in her interview in 1999 that the word sexual harassment, if it had been coined, you had never heard it in this country. So no one really conceptualized what these women were going through as sexual harassment because they didn't really have that term. She said this was in the days before sexual harassment was a notion. It was in the days before there was any recognition really that these things were wrong. She said in her interview, he was surrounded by his acolytes, all of whom he did this and had put up with it for years. And who was I to start complaining? It wasn't though he had raped me or anything. All he did was stick his hand on my knee and suggest that we sit on his bed. He told her that when she got a scholarship, that it was her intelligence and not her beautiful blue eyes that got her the position. So you can see he's just being pervy on her. He's touching her when she didn't want to be touched and so on. And this is something that the women in that time period, other women also said that Toshval would do on a regular basis. And the males knew about it, but they just figured this is Toshval, he's in charge, it's his group. And so they didn't really do anything about it. It was just something that women would put up with is that men would be touched, would be touching them and hitting on them a lot. And it was just the atmosphere in the 70s and early 80s. Now he passed away, Toshval, in 1982. But you get a good picture of what it was like though in that period from these interviews that were done in 1999. So this is actually again from Young and Haggerty. This is what they wrote in their article. They say, Gratitude for their training at Bristol notwithstanding, several of Tajfell's women students later made issues of gender central to their work, whilst also extending social identity theory to gender in ways that Tajfell would have seemed inconsequential. These initiatives were part of a larger effort to make British social psychology into a more feminist enterprise. Geventing noted ironically over time with Tajfell, what I learned at his feet was the basis of my developing feminism. For many who experienced the masculinist ethos of experimental social psychology at Bristol, feminism was a path forward, not simply in terms of personal politics, but as a framework for remaking the field. So it's interesting is that even though he himself hadn't really shown much interest in gender and identity, his treatment of his women students seemed to have caused them to later to research on feminist topics and talking about social identity of gender. And so it's the ironic output of all of that. This kind of thing of having a well-known professor use his influence on these women in this sort of way, we now recognize maybe because of the Me Too movement and so on as inappropriate and definitely recognizing it, it shows us this power differential where you've got a powerful professor and a relatively low status PhD student who doesn't have much power. She can't really complain at the time because she might lose her position, she might lose her contacts and so on. So she puts up with this kind of harassment that he's giving her. The thing is, you might think that's all on the past, but there have been even more recent examples of this kind of thing happening all over academia, even in social psychology. I know of a case, for instance, in just the last few years where a famous professor in psychology at Oxford University had to step down because he had complaints of sexual harassment by his students. And rather than making it a public thing where he, his name is out there and there's news stories and stuff, they just quietly dismissed him from the university so they wouldn't attract any big attention from the news media and he's basically lost his job because of the kinds of things that he was doing just within the last five years or so. I bring all of that up because of course this kind of issue happens in other aspects of life in jobs and so on but the one of the things that we're trying to bring up here is how has psychology then as a research discipline been influenced by examples like this, by the way people thought of women as participants like in Aronson and Mill's study, or the fact that women being trained in the field are being affected by an advisor who harasses them all the time. So it's, you have to think perhaps some of these women maybe would have done something differently. Maybe there were women who would have come into the field and stuck with it if they hadn't been harassed by powerful men like this. In any way, because of this article by Young and Haggerty and making Toshfell, who's really known as a very famous influential social psychologist in our field, that when they made these interviews 
more public in this article. And they've, like I said, they've been recorded back in 1999. When this article appeared in 2019, it caused a flurry of activity in terms of how are people now going to deal with the truth behind Henri Tajbel. And one of the one of the big things that happened was that the European Association of Social Psychology, which Tajfel himself was Im important in forming way back when, back in the decades ago, their highest award that they've been giving for many years was called the Henri Tajfel Medal, and it was given to people who were the most outstanding person in the field, according to the European Association of Social Psychology. So once a year or once every three years when they had their big meeting, they would give out this award and say, you've got that Henri Tajville Award. And it was a huge honor to get that award. You can see that what happened after this article came out is they released an announcement here where they've renamed the award. And it says it's recently been documented that Tajfel showed reprehensible and unacceptable behaviors towards female members of his lab. While this does not question Tajfel's theoretical contribution to social psychology as a field and to our association in particular, we believe that we must look at his legacy in a different way. And one direct consequence of the light of his reported misconduct is that our organization will not continue to honor Tajfel by connecting his name to our most prestigious Lifetime Achievement Award. Naming an award after a person suggests that this individual is a role model as a scientist and beyond, which Henri Tajfel clearly is not, according to ESAP's current standards. So they no longer call it the Henri Tajfel Medal, and it's now, I don't even know actually, in fact, what <laughs> name it is now, but they have a new Lifetime Achievement Award from the Society, and they've stripped his name from that medal because of this historical analysis that was done in this paper that I just told you about. I just also want to mention that there were a group of sort of senior male social psychologists in this organization that objected to this changing of the medal's name. And you can see this is a letter that they published to the executive committee that was passed around by email. And you can see down at the bottom the two professors who led this challenge to the renaming of the Tajville Award. And they call, their names are Fritz Strock and Wolfgang. And basically they argue here is that they don't feel like there was due process that that, you know, that these are just some accusations that were being made in these oral interviews. And because Toshil's not around to defend himself, it seems unfair that we just accept whatever these women happen to say about this and then change the awards name. But you can read that more later in your, yourself if you'd like. All right. So there you go. There's something that just happened fairly recently in psychology where we got a historical paper that had an impact on at least one society's changing of its name for its metal, and perhaps has changed the way that people are going to be talking about Tajfel in future psychology courses. So that leads me to my next topic for today's lecture, which is why do we even study the history of psychology? Why study it? And I want to give you some really good reasons for this, because I think some people think it's silly to talk about things from the past. Psychology is about the present and about the future. Why would we be studying the past? It's interesting that in Australia, the history of psychology isn't regularly taught to psychology students in this country. You're one of the few students, in fact, groups of students in Australia who probably are actually getting a course in history of psychology this year. In contrast to that, in the United States and Canada, they actually are required to take a history of psychology class, particularly when they're doing their PhDs in the graduate school. So it's a regularly taught thing in the North American context. And in fact, I originally began teaching this course to PhD students and then in fact, undergrad courses as well in the history of psychology because it's more regularly taught there and it's required more often in many universities in their psychology departments, but not here in Australia. So going back to why would anybody require it? Why would anybody want to take a course in the history of psychology? One thing I think you're going to see is that knowing about the history of our field helps us to unify the discipline. It helps us to understand what we have in common because we do have some common origins, no matter what kind of psychology we do now, what kind of psychology we are interested in. It all traces back to just a few key individuals way in the past who's invented the field of psychology. Another question is, or another way to think about why history is important is that it's probably a key to understanding the future. To understand how things went in the past, maybe will help us make a prediction about new trends or new interests or things that we haven't covered yet because of things that have happened in the past. And I think you're also going to see that learning about the history of psychology teaches us humility 
And we think we know so much today about the brain and about behavior and how psychology works. And then you start reading about what somebody said about it a hundred years ago and you realize, wow, we haven't really advanced that much. In fact, people knew quite a bit about psychology already a hundred years ago. So it makes us feel a little bit more humble about the progress of our field. I think it also teaches a healthy skepticism. You're going to see that there are many different fads that have happened in the history of psychology where people thought they really understood this is the methodology or this is the concept that will explain everything. And it turns out later on that people abandoned it because it's highly flawed. Probably the reason why I was always interested in the history of psychology is because it's interesting in its own right. I find that the characters, the people, their ideas, their stories really interesting. And so to me, it's just interesting to learn about history. So that might be another reason why you'd want to study the history of psychology is because it's interesting to learn about. Now, as we look at the history of psychology as a discipline, you're going to see there's some recurring issues, some things that we have to keep dealing with over and over again. For example, one of the key issues for the history of psychology is what is our data? What are we actually using to understand the history? Are we reading letters? Are we looking at people's old diaries? Are we getting secondhand accounts of what happened? You can see, for instance, in 1999, there were these oral histories, but already several years have passed since those people gave those oral interviews and perhaps they already were not remembering things correctly because time had passed. So the data for any historical analysis becomes quite important. Another question is, can it be objective? That is, can we really look at the history of psychology and objectively describe and say, this is the way it actually happened? Or is there more subjectivity? Is there more maybe three or four different ways that you could explain what actually happened in 1910 in a particular laboratory? And so that's a question about how truly objective can we be when we're doing a historical analysis. This next one, presentism versus historicism, is one that a lot of my students over the years have struggled with when they've taken this course. And the idea here is that, do we look at things that happen in the past through our present lens, the way we think about things today in terms of our lens of today and what our values are, and what we're like, for instance, the Me Too movement or whatever it happens to be. And then we're going to judge or interpret people's behaviors from the past based on the way we think today. Or should we try to have what's historicism, which is that you try to understand the way people might have been thinking back then in 1910 or 1890 or 1955 and try to understand their context of the way that they were thinking then. And perhaps that will shed it and be more fruitful in helping us understand why people had a particular idea or a particular belief about the way psychology worked. Another issue that comes up is whether or not there are any patterns or directions in the history of psychology. So for example, one kind of pattern that could be that you've often heard about is that history repeats itself. So it's this idea that there's a cyclical hypothesis that history just keeps going back and repeating the same old things over and over again. We go through these fads of up and down, up and down, and we come back and look at the same questions over and over again. There's the linear progressive hypothesis, which kind of believes that our pattern is that we're slowly building in a straight line forward in our knowledge about the human mind or behavior. And we're just kind of adding on more and more information as each decade passes in this kind of nice linear progressive way. There's also the chaos, chaos hypothesis, which is basically saying it's not really a pattern, that there's actually no real structure that you could understand about the way historical thought and psychology should go. And so it's a more chaotic sort of explanation or pattern. Another question that we could look at when you look at the history of psychology is what should be the focus of the history of psychology? And this is, again, something that historians of psychology have struggled with over the last 100 years. There's this one idea that you could do, it's called the great person perspective, where you say our history of psychology is really the, it's really the product of several really great figures in the history of psychology, mostly white men, who had great ideas, great theories like Freud or whatever. And so if we understand that great person and then move on to the next great person and the next great person, that's what the history of psychology is, just to understand how these great people think. Another perspective you could take is what's called the zeitgeist perspective. And the zeitgeist perspective says the way that we understand what's going on in a particular time period is not really about the individuals. We can talk about more like the cultural context of that time and say perhaps that the reason why Freud, for instance, had the ideas that he had 
was because he lived in Vienna at the turn of the last century. And right when that particular time period was happening, it wasn't just Freud that had all these kind of crazy ideas about sex. There were a lot of those kinds of ideas going on in the art world and in science and in music and so on. And so the zeitgeist was to think about things as fighting sexual repression. And Freud was just one of those people living at that time who could take those ideas and apply it to psychology. So it's saying that rather than focusing on the individual, focus on the zeitgeist, the spirit of the time. There's also this analysis known as Kuhn's analysis, and Kuhn wrote some books in the early 60s about analyzing the way he thought that science progressed. And he talked in his work about fields of inquiry being first pre-paradigmatic. So if you take physics or chemistry or psychology, he says that all these fields start out in a, an initial stage that they call pre-paradigmatic, which is when they, the people who are in that field all use different methods. They don't really agree on what the good questions are that we should all be studying. Everybody's just like saying, hey, there's just lots of things here and no one's really agreeing on the methods. So it's pre-paradigmatic. He said that a scientific field is then characterized as having a paradigm for many years. It goes to a more mature scientific field when there's a paradigm and a paradigm is meant to be kind of like a common way of doing things in that field. So that chemistry would have a common way of doing chemistry research, or physics has a common way of doing physics research and physics theory and physics, think physics thinking. And that as long as it goes on for many years that way, it has a paradigm and it's a more mature field. Now, according to Kuhn, occasionally there's a disruption in this paradigm. Every once in a while, the paradigm is going to shift. You're going to have a major change, a paradigm shift. And he called these scientific revolutions. And so a good example of a scientific, scientific revolution is what happened when Einstein came up with his theory of relativity. It just changed the way physics was thought about after that point. And he talked in his book a little bit about where such revolutions come from. And he argued in his analysis that sort of two main ingredients about revolutions and the why paradigms shift or change is because first of all they usually come from younger people in the field so when you're younger in the field not some old famous professor you're more likely to institute a revolution and secondly it comes from people who are outsiders in the field so people who are not doing the main paradigm that everybody else is doing. They're thinking a little bit differently. They're outside the box. They're over on the edge of the field. And you can see then why would young people and people outside the box cause revolutions? Because they're not so bought into whatever the existing paradigm is in their field right now. And so they have they don't have this investment in just doing it the same old way that everybody else has always done it. And so they go ahead and propose a new way of doing it, a new way of thinking about the questions, a new way of doing the research and so on. Now, history of psychology itself has been its own subdiscipline in psychology for a long time. And this is probably the first time a lot of you have ever even heard of this, that just like we have clinical psychology or developmental psychology, in some departments around the world, there's a history of psychology program. And so you can go do a PhD in the history of psychology. In fact, the very first big history book in the history of psychology goes back to 1913. So Baldwin wrote a history of psychology, a sketch and interpretation. You might think, how could he have already written a book back in 1913 on the history of psychology? It's actually quite a thick volume. So it was already scholarship going on in the history of psychology back in 1913. We have other books here, multiple volumes that were published by Brett called A History of Psychology between 1912 and 1921. One of the great historians in the history of psychology was Boring, and it's funny that that's his surname, Boring. Well, Boring had a couple volumes of his book. One came out in 1929, another one in 1950, and that was called A History of Experimental Psychology. 1965 was a key year in the history of psychology as a subdiscipline. This is when there was a, a journal called the Journal of the History of the Behavioral Sciences was first started. This is also when the American Psychological Association started a new division 26 called the history of psychology. So you had at the annual meeting of the American Psychological Association, a group of historians would get together every year and present papers on history. And it was also in 1965 that the archives of the history of the American psychology was established in Akron, Ohio. And this tends to be one of the biggest centers for the history of psychology in the world now. It's not just American history. You can see there's their webpage, the Center for the History of Psychology. It's no longer called American History. And they focus on all sorts of different historical records of psychology. 
and it's a whole building. I've never got to go there, but they have a lot of the a lot of cool apparatuses and papers and things that different psychologists, when they've retired, their estate donates their equipment or their papers to the Center for the History of Psychology. So a historian of psychology can go spend some time there and do research on a person or an idea that they want to learn more about. So if you ever want to look at that, you can look at it. It's at www.uacron.edu slash chp. In 1967, you get your first PhD program in the history of psychology at the University of New Hampshire. And the history of psychology, a journal, was published in 1998. So that's another place now where you can publish papers on the history of psychology. So there's some feedback about what we know about the history of psychology. That's all I'm going to talk about for today.